Greetings, listeners, and welcome to The Spiritual Experience, a show where we share stories of life, love, and redemption for all of humanity on Earth. So sit back and enjoy. Try to identify with the speakers and not compare. Don't forget to subscribe on all podcast platforms. I'm your host, Jay Lewis, and here we go. Okay, everybody, we're back. Spiritual experience. Hope you guys are doing well. It is the week of... What week is it? Uh, The week, uh, second week in February. Or, yeah, second week in February, Valentine's Day is around the corner. Hopefully you guys are getting yourself together to get a gift or something for your significant other or just even being there and being nice is the gift. We have a little bit of a break as far as um, my guests are involved. You know, we had a couple of people line up, uh, sorry, lined up, and then, you know, some stuff fell through and whatever. So for the next, uh, I guess, couple episodes, it's just going to be you and I, family. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot going on. Every day there's a lot going on. You know, this is life. We're just kind of traveling through it, and, you know, what can I say? <clears throat> it's, been some, uh, it's been some ride. It's been some ride. But, um, so I figured, you know, I kind of have an idea of what I wanted to talk about today. Typically, I don't. Typically, I just get on here and just give you an ear beaten and just kind of just talk myself into oblivion. But what I did was... Um, you know, I ordered some literature, AA literature, which I thought was really poignant. Um, I have the Living Sober book. I have uh, the 24-hour book, which is not a uh, AA-approved literature, but it's put out there by Hazelton, who, you know, puts out a lot of good stuff and helps a lot of good people, and it's it's been really helpful. So they have like a daily reflection I'm going to read a little bit of it and it's actually pretty good today because today's February 7th so this will probably drop tomorrow which is nice I'm sorry I'm a little bit of a last minute Lucy but it's okay it's my show all right February 7th the thought for the day a nightclub crowded with men and women all dressed up in evening clothes looks like a very festive place But you should see the restrooms of that nightclub the next morning. What a mess. People have been sick all over the place. And does it smell? The glamour of the night before is all gone and only the stink of the morning after is left. In AA, we learn to take a long view of drinking instead of a short view. We learn to think less about the pleasure of the moment and more about the consequences. Has the night before become less important to me and the morning after, more important. It's pretty good stuff. Then they also have like a meditation for the day and a prayer for the day. Uh, what does the prayer say? I pray that the divine power of God will help my human weakness. I pray that my prayer may reach through the darkness to the ear of God. All right, that prayer is a little bit much, but that's okay. Um Yeah, so here's the deal. What are they talking about? Or what do I perceive it? Um, You know, many of us in our life have fallen, you know, victim to, I guess, you know, living for the moment or living in the moment or short-sighted, you know, not playing the tape through is what they call it. You don't play the tape all the way through, which is um, whatever. It's it's actually... um, it's pretty bad, you know, can, it, if, if it ends up in your favor, if you don't play the tape all the way through, then you just kind of got lucky. And in the last week or two, you know, there were some, some unfortunate events that have gone on around me that have reminded me of stuff that, uh, that I lived with, you know. The two events is one, actually they involved the death of two uh, young uh, kids, 
you know, pretty sad. One one young man, you know, he, uh, you know, he got stabbed to death outside of a bar in Bay Ridge. And the other, um, the other young man, he died somehow in Atlanta. I don't have all of the details, but um, the first kid was the best friend of one of my dear friends. And, uh, you know, he was the best friend of a, of a young kid that used to work f- for me. And I know his mom and his stepdad really well. And the second uh, death, which it did literally happened within a few days of each other, was the best friend of a kid that works for me. And the kid that works for me is, um, I don't know how old he is. He's 20. He's, I don't think he's 21. He's not even 21. He's making pretty good money. Anyway, so he was just with his boy like the week before. And and the other kid, um, the family friend, you know, he was there same night but left early. And then, you know, rumble in the street. And these things happen, man. It's so crazy how life could, you know, take these sharp turns, you know. It's sad. It's sad. And it's, you know, it's a reflection of the unpredictability of life. And my heart goes out to everybody who was hurt, you know, emotionally by these things. Because it's devastating, man. It really is. And especially when you're young, man. When you're young, you don't even... I don't know. You don't even know. It's like your life is going one way and then it turns on a dime and goes another way. And the, I guess you can call it the trauma of that. You know, it's really, it's it's unspeakable, I guess. I don't know how to even describe it. When you're that young, you know, it reminded me of you know, kids that I grew up with that met their demise, you know, and that's a little bit dramatic. I'm sorry I said that if it's a little disrespectful. But, you know, they died early. And, you know, it's a very, it's a very sad thing. A very sad thing. And when that happens... Who knows how to respond? What kind of response could it could could it be? You know, what could you actually do to help the situation? It's hard to even make those choices when you're a young person, late teens, early twenties, in in those predicaments. And um, I don't know what kind of tools. I wouldn't even know what to tell somebody. You know, I wouldn't even know what to tell somebody. There's no, you don't want to put any philosophies or any of this stuff on there. It's it's just sad. The first time that that happened for me, that it was very impactful, was, um, you know, my close... Everybody, I always say this, everybody was my best friend when I was a kid. And this kid, he was my best friend. Everybody's my best friend, maybe six months or a year or two years at a time. I don't know. Anyway, his name was uh, his name was Carl, Carl McIntyre. And he was incredible. He was such a character, this guy. He was incredible. He used to babysit my son. He was friends with my son's uh, mother's family. And then him and I became very, very good friends. And we'd hang out every day and we were young maybe 17, 18, I don't even know how old I was. Yeah, it was me, Carl, Vinny, Irv, shout out to Irv from Fred Heck, what up? Um, yeah, and yeah, we would just do what young people would do. We'd drive around in my car, you know, smoke weed, drink beer, play spades, chase girls, whatever. And Carl was like a very, he was like a very energetic 
uh, guy. And he was very, he was a tough kid, man. This kid, he was tough. And he grew up, um, he grew up up, uh, up top on Ewing in those apartments over there in Spring Valley, the hill. Yeah, he grew up there, but he never really hung out there. I don't know why he didn't hang out too tough over there, but he would always come to uh, the other side of town where my son's mom lived. And, um, you know, I met his mom one time. Uh, and I think he had a brother. I met his brother. And, um, you know, we hung out all the time. And we're as close as any kids can be at that age. It, if you think about it, it's like, you know, how close the stand-by-me kids are. You know, except we're older, but we're that close, you know. And... Um, you know, yeah, he was a tough kid, man. He liked to, he like, I wouldn't say he liked to fight. Yeah, he liked to fight. <laughs> he liked to fight. But when, also when you're that, it's, you know, it's part of the game. Like, you know, you like to fight when you're a kid. You get drunk, you throw punches at each other. We used to wrestle around all the time in the snow. He always wore these army fatigues <laughs> and these army hats. Yeah, and he was a tough, my parents loved him. You know, my parents loved him. He was great. He was of Jamaican descent, I believe, yeah. Because then he used to bust out his uh, his patois periodically. Um, yeah, he used to do that. And what else? But he was like Irish. You know, his last name was McIntyre. <laughs> so it was funny. And I'm not speaking out of term because, you know, he, I love him so much and I miss him. But... um. Yeah, what happened was we were, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe we were 18 or 19. And he could have met uh, a violent demise like any any of the rest of us or like the two kids that I was talking about, you know, because wrong place, wrong time. And I could go on for another 50 minutes about that, you know, how many times we just escaped death and over the years how many people we lost because of short-sighted, thinking and just reacting and ego and all this other stuff so yeah it's pretty uh pretty rough anyway so carl he it wasn't the streets that got him it wasn't it wasn't anything else like he he was complaining about these headaches and i'm trying to remember everything it was so long ago he was complaining about these headaches and he went into the uh, to the hospital. I forgot which hospital it was. And um, they said he had a sinus infection. So he had a sinus infection, I guess. And he was in the bed. He was a big kid. I mean, big kid. He was like, what are you? What am I gonna say? Maybe six one, two hundred, for for a teenager, late teenager, early twenties. If he would have lived, he would have been jacked. So <clears throat> either way, he has this uh, sinus infection. And I don't know how. I don't, I don't know. They weren't watching him or whatever. And uh, he tried to get out of the bed or something. And he fell. And he hit his head on the, on the floor. And he hit his head on the floor. And they didn't find him for a little while. And I guess... Allegedly, um, or apparently, this was the story they told me. I was so devastated that it, you know, my brain is a little foggy around uh, the situation. But the infection spread in his brain because he was he cracked his head on the floor, and um, within a couple of days, two or three days, he was dead. And it was so sad because I knew he was in the hospital, and I was, I was just gonna go over there. I was like, oh, he's in the hospital. I was like, why is he in the hospital? He's got these headaches. They're like, yeah, sinus infection, whatever. So then I just go over there, and it must have just happened because I get there, and I see his mom. His mom's, like, crying, and she's, like, trying to hold me and trying to hug me. I'm like, fuck is going on? And she said, uh, he's gone. I was like, what? They're like, yeah, he's gone. He's, he, he died. And even reliving that now, I was just so numb. 
I didn't even know what to do. I didn't even cry because I was just, you know, I was just numb and it was so sad. And then I called um, my son's uh, mother's house to let them know. I had to call them, let them know, listen, man, I don't know what happened, but he's gone. He's, he died. And yeah, and it, it lives with me. Freaking guy. Man, he was the best guy. He really was. He was the best guy. And it was so traumatizing for me. I didn't even know how to deal with it. I can't tell you what my parents told me, if they told me anything about how to deal with these types of situations and how to deal with whatever. You know, I know his mom, like, his, I don't know. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to make a, an off-colored remark, but, you know, I, don't, I think the whole situation could have been handled better. At the time, my uh, I call on my brother-in-law. I call everybody my brother-in-law. If you got kids by one of my, by my baby mom's sister, I guess you're my brother-in-law, even though we're not even with them and we're not even married, but that's how we're related to each other. And he's, he was also my well, one of my best friends at the time, Joel. And then Joel just came home. Shout out. What up? Um, yeah, he went to the funeral and he freaked out at the funeral. I didn't even go. That's how lost I was. They were call- They called me. They're like, yo, the funeral's this, this, and this day. We're raising money. We're doing this. Boom, boom, boom. Right? The family. I forgot who called me. I think it was, I think it was Jason or maybe it was just Carl's mom. She called my house. I didn't even know how to react. I didn't know how to respond. You know, there was no tools. There was no nothing. And um, and then there's no, there's, there's nothing you can do. Like, well, it's not like somebody, you know, somebody took his life. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to go there with 10 guys and beat up the, the nurse or something or, or whatever it is? Like, I don't know. I didn't even know what to do with that uh, sorrow. It was just sorrow, man. And it, um, it was just kind of like moss that was growing, you know. So for these, um, and, and yeah, I don't think there's anything anybody could have said except for that this is part of life and this is very unfortunate and this sucks and I'm so sorry. And there's going to be unexplainable feelings and there's going to be Anger is going to be a lot of things, you know. It's just a lot. It's especially for a young person. And then as you get older, <clears throat> you know, you do sadly understand and realize that this is just a part of life. That you're going to lose people who are close to you. And at any moment, Everything could be different. You know, everything could be different. So it goes into like, how do you want to spend your days? You know, when I, when I, um, the kid that works with me, I haven't really spoke to him yet because, you know, there's layers of people between him and I. But I'm going to talk to him next time I see him. You know, because, you know, we can't let these situations you know, forget about the morning after the bathroom in the nightclub, you know, because you just want to pacify those hurt feelings. And maybe he may go out there with his people and maybe he'll try and do something. Um, The family friend, Butter, I don't know. Maybe they'll try and do something, you know. And these are young kids that have a whole life ahead of them that it can be ruined in one in one shot you know in one yeah in one instance you can make a decision or not even make a decision i wouldn't even say make a decision i would say you can impulsively act on emotion that is out of control that will cause you to close every door that is open for you to uh have a successful and happy life you know, 
there were so many, so many other things that happened. And then as, you know, I don't even know if I wanted to even talk about this. There's so much stuff. Okay. I'll go into it a little bit. And if anybody gets mad, that's okay. I don't know how many people from back home are listening anyway. So there was this one kid. I'm not going to name his name. Um, we'll call him. Let me, let me switch the names right now. We're going to call him Jake. Okay. Um, so one kid, Jake. When I was a young kid, he, uh, he was like a little bit of a bully. Actually, he just was. And I remember, um, I remember I was in like fourth or sixth, fourth grade or something. He was like in sixth grade. And uh, he lived in a way tougher area than I lived in. He lived, uh, yeah, I don't even want to say where he lived. But he did. He definitely did. In my town, you know, we all went to the same school, but my block was nice. I had like a house that I grew up in, regular high ranch house, middle class family. He grew up in these apartments down Union Road. Anyway, so this kid, <clears throat> he, um, yeah, he was like a bully. And he was way bigger than the rest of us. And I remember one time he took me by my shirt and threw me into a bookshelf in, um, in the library. Just threw me into the bookshelf in the library. And I was like, I don't know how old I was. I was 10 years old. And he was like maybe 12. He threw me into the bookshelf. And then it was funny because on parent-teacher night, I saw him. And I, I don't know why I said something, but I said something. I was like, dude, that's the kid that threw me into the fucking bookshelf. And my my dad like looked at him. I was like, you know, number one, the kid had me by like 60 pounds or whatever, 70. Who knows? He was a big kid, a big chubby uh, kid. So my dad grabbed him and my dad threw him. And then just, you know, he barked and yelled at him. You know, this my dad's famous saying, go get your father. Like, I think that's a thing from like the 70s and the 80s. Like somebody would want to. They, they want to kick your dad's ass in front of you. You know, that's it's so great because they obviously they don't want to hit the kid, but they, he grabbed him up a little bit, you know. Either way, that kid grows up. <clears throat> we all grow up. I don't really see him honestly after that, even though we're all kind of moving around in the same small pond, you know. Uh, you know, he's doing his thing. I'm doing my thing. So he ends up... Um, yeah, what happened? Yeah, I think I was, and then I, and then it was like teenage years, and it was nothing really popping. And then I get older and I leave. And I got sober. I got my job on on Wall Street. Well, I got my job on Wall Street. Then I got sober, and I just left that. It was people, places, and things I left. So he, uh, Jake, he gets murdered. Um, yeah, he got murdered. He got shot. And. I wasn't really that that uh, sad over it, but I didn't really know. No, you know, I was I was already far removed. You know, fast forward a few more years, and one of my other close friends, we're gonna call him, well, him I'll just we'll call him Bird. My other close friend Bird, who I fucking loved. Oh my god, I love this guy so much. He's such a sweet guy, but. You know, he, you know, he's like me. He was an addict, you know, and he ended up passing away. So I go back upstate to Bird's funeral. And funny, oddly enough, I go with Joel. Me, Joel, we go to Bird's funeral. And um, it was sad, man. He left back a bunch of kids and all of my whole crew was there. And, and then there was this kid, this other kid, well, cool. Whatever. His name is Damien, right? So this other kid, Damien, Damien's car breaks down, right? And like, but he's part of the whole, he's part of the whole uh, posse that's there. He's like, dude, dude oh, his car broke down. Now, I'm like, okay. I was like, listen, I don't have a lot of room because at the time I just had my El Camino with me. So I left Joel at the bar. I said, bro, I'll take you wherever you got to go. You know, we're all in the spirit of old school. Everybody's like in shock, even, even, um, my my old school friend, they're in shock that I'm not drinking. They're like, well, we can't even imagine you not drinking. Meanwhile, by this time, I've been sober. 
I don't know, maybe seven, eight years or something, or whatever. Anyway, so I take I take Damien to to his car. He leaves it somewhere. Then we call another kid that we grew up that started a tow truck company, and we bring the and he's gonna go tow the car. We're on the way, and me and Damien we know each other peripherally. His crew was a different crew than mine, and Damien was like, he was just grateful and he thanked me, and we're just sitting there chopping it up. And then he told me that that car was Jake's old car, like the bully guy that threw me into the bookshelf. That was his old car. And after he was murdered, this guy has it now. However he got it, I think they gave, the family gave it to him, whatever, because they were very, very close friends. Very close friends. You know, and I'm like, wow, that's this guy's car. And oddly enough, it was one of my other very close friends. We'll call him Donald. Um, one of my, it was my, like, my one of my other running buddies, Donald. It was Donald's brother that killed Jake. So one of my closest friends, one of my best friend's brother killed the the bully. And then I'm over here bringing Damien to the car to get it told by another guy we know. It's just like such small town, like, you know, like that movie, like the four brothers. It was like six degrees of separation. Is that what they call it or whatever? I don't know what they call it, but it was like my eyeballs were like opening like beyond wild. So now you have, you know, as everybody grew up, it was Jake's people, my people were all in the same place for my, my boy Bird, who I've, you know, I'll never say a bad uh, thing about that guy. You know, he meant well and he was a good, good man, you know, but stuff got a hold of him. So, and we're all there and I'm the only sober one, which is wild. And as everybody grew up, now we're in our 30s, they learned... You know, they learned how to how to move on the chessboard. They learned how to let shit go. You know, because impulsively, you know, Jake's people could have came after my my boys, my friends, and then you know, it would have just turned into a mess. But I don't know how they managed to uh, they managed to leave it alone, and now we're all in the same freaking funeral home in the same bar. Everybody drinking, everybody whatever. And that was like a small thing. You know, I guess for the greater good they, they figured out how to how to work it out. And most of the most of the people in this story do not have fathers in their life. You know? And the kid that works for me, he doesn't have a dad. Other family friend butter, he's got a very good uh He's got a good foundation. He's got a good home. He's got a good mom. I know his stepdad really well. You know, he's also a good guy. You know, we're all just trying to make it. But like, yeah, what do you tell these kids? You know, what kind of tools can we give them? We can just tell them about not being impulsive and not not trying to, almost like you got to let the pain come. You got to let the pain come and then you got to, and then eventually you will let it you will let it go it will leave you you know the one thing i told them i told the the i told butter was like dude you know some things you just don't get over from my experience you know you learn how to live with it and i think that's the key the key is how do you learn how to live with that kind of stuff you know and then it just makes you really think about the moments that you share with the people that you love you know, the moments you share with people that you love. And I think that's what really matters. You know, it, it brings it all back into perspective. At any given moment, this whole thing could be upside down. The whole thing could change. You know, my mom used to always tell me, people make choices. That was, oh my God, that was the worst. She would tell me all the time. Anytime the police were coming, anytime all this other stuff. It's funny because it, when I talked about the El Camino, so um, it brings me back to when I had to go and uh, had to do something. I had to get something notarized. And we went by the courthouse 
or so or wherever um I don't know why we had to go to the courthouse. We had to do something over there. I forgot. But I had to do with the car. Because I just bought that car. And um, my son was 18. I gifted it to myself. <laughs> because he got out of high school and he was going to college. And I, apparently I did a good job raising him up to that point. So I gifted myself this El Camino. It was so dope, this car. Anyway, so I go to the I go by the courthouse where I grew up with my mom, and my mom was like crying, man. And she was like, "Jared, the last time we came over here, you was on jail, you know." <laughs> and then I laughed, you know, I laughed, and she was proud of me, you know. We were riding around in my car, took her out to lunch or something, and it was a funny thing. It was funny. Yeah, so, you know, she would always preach to me you know people make choices so much that i have it tattooed on me and as, a, as an ode to my homage to my mama and it's the truth man people make choices you know so what kind of choices do we want to make in these situations or just in in regular life regular life what kind of choices do we want to make how do we want to spend our time what do we want to do? You know, there's such a limited, it's a limited time that we're even here. And we have to find some people to love. That's the answer for me. You got to find some people to love. And you just got to love them. And that's how you got to spend your time. You got to love them. And it's not always easy. I was listening to a clip from uh, Jordan Peterson. Shout out to him, another recovering addict. Anyway, so Jordan was talking about um, that people, it, they don't invest their time wisely or effectively, right? Because he just came out of this bad thing. He was sick and he, he was hooked on clonopins or something or Xanax or whatever. He was, it was bad. I like the, you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because it's like a very crazy thing. You know, the, the pharmacology industry, if that's the right word, the one where like you go to the doctor, you just give them some symptoms. They tell you, they diagnose you based on what you tell them. They don't do any kind of brain scan or anything like that. And then they just start medicating you up. Anyway, that's what happened with him. And he should have been smarter, but whatever. I don't know. I, apparently, it helped him for a while. And then he tried to get off. And he found out, yeah, poof. Tried getting off of those. What are those bar, barbiturates? Is that what they're called? I don't know. I never really took those. Either way. But what he was saying and what he found out was true was that, you know, you, what doesn't, most of the time, we're just running through life in our routine. Get up. Go to work. Go to gym. Go to this, that. Boom. Come home. Right? And you work, and you maybe save some money, and then you go on vacation, you go sit on a beach, or you go on a cruise, or you go wherever you go, right? And you would think that that's, that's, the, uh, that's the gift. They'd say, okay, I did all of this stuff, and here we are. Now we're skiing somewhere. And look at us, we're all together. Now, you're in, now you get to relax and enjoy those moments and, and experiences with your, with your family, with your loved ones. It could be your friends, your best friends. You know, all of that stuff. It could be that. You know, and he said, he realized more important than that. You know, it doesn't matter where you take them or any of those vacations or this other shit. More important is how are you spending those 15 or 20 minutes at the breakfast table with your family, with your spouse, with your partner, with your kids? Every day, those 20 minutes, that half an hour that, you know, that you're, that you're together, that's where the magic is, not in Disney World. And it was so profound to me because I was like, I, I believe that before he said it, but I didn't, you know, I came to believe that. 
that how do I want to spend my time? So when I'm with people that I love, you know, I know what it's like to lose people that I love. I, I just went through one story. I could go through 20 stories of, uh, of guys that I knock around, guys that I was with growing up that are no longer with us. Over time, the longer I've stayed sober, um, by the time we were at Bird's funeral, people were happy that I was sober. Initially, they were pissed off because I abandoned them for my own recovery. And then they were like, dude, thank God, because by this time, we lost a few of them to uh, drug overdoses, drinking and driving, jail, the penitentiary, penitentiary, I don't know the right word. But yeah. Yeah, so I know what it's like to lose love, loved ones. I lost my sister to this disease, man. And that was uh, very eye-opening for me. It was very sobering for me. She never made it. And that was like the separation that I feel from that. You know, and we didn't even really care for each other that much. We loved each other, like the trauma bonding, like two Marines in a hole or something because we both came out of the same fire pit. But, you know, yeah, she didn't make it. And it sucks, man. And then I, when I, I recognize that in my life, that people don't realize how lucky they are that they have each other. And it's not about family reunions and it's not about, you know, those picnics. Yeah, you make time for the picnics. That stuff is good too. It's about what's going on in your home, you know, those moments that you guys spend together and how, you know, how you show up for other people that you love in any supporting kind of way. And um, I think that's what really matters because at the end of the day, you know, we're all going to end up in the ground. You know, and I don't want to be like kind of like melancholy or whatever. I don't want this to be super sappy episode. Sorry if it is. But it's just the truth. This is life. You know, what I also learned. And um, I always give props to whoever. None of my ideas are really. There's not an original thought. It's pieces of from other people that I admire. Or it's people that I don't admire. They say things that resonate with me. I was watching a little bit of an interview with T.K. Kirkland. T to the mother K. Yeah, he's the best. Everybody's the best. But he said, it's not about how good you live. It's about how good you die. And I was like, wow. That's so powerful. Like, how good am I going to die? Am I going to die with my loved ones, you know, being close to me, not out of obligation, but out of love and care and celebration? Or am I going to die alone, you know, alone? And that all depends on how I treat people. It all depends on how forgiving I am to everybody. Um with my incessant demands. It also it all depends on, you know, depends on the kind of people I surround myself with. I try to stay with positive people if I can. And if you are negative and you are around me, I'm not going to run away right away. But I'll try and help you as best I can. You know, and that's a goal for me. So I want to, I want to die good. You know, when I leave here, and I'm good right now. If something happened right now, I promise you, like, I've had an extraordinary life. You know, and I don't go looking for it, uh, all the bad stuff. But, yeah, you know, I've had an extraordinary life. I lived like a complete uncaged, unhinged animal for the first third of my life. Uh, yeah. And then I, I cleaned up my act, and I've been good for almost 20 years. And so the rest, of, and during that time, I did all of the growing up. So I wasn't, you know, I was not a box of chocolate chip cookies. I was a little bit, you know, I was on my way. But now I'm a happy, loving, sober man. 
you know, and I have been for quite some time. And um, I have admiration and respect for other human beings. And I have a lot of love for a lot of people. I don't have that much hate. You know, I'm a human being. So there's definitely people that I don't like, that I can't stand. But, you know, it's nice. It's nice to know this kind of stuff. And it's nice that other people are being, what, how can I say this? I get a lot of messages about our show. This is our show, yours and mine. Whoever's listening, wherever you're listening, you are part of my family. Even if we don't know each other. And we may not because, you know, we have, you know, we have a lot of people listening. I don't, I'm not in, obsessed with the stats, but they're pretty good. They are pretty good. You know? and, um, and I get good feedback from anonymous people. Oh, not, I wouldn't say anonymous, people that I don't know. So which is good. But, you know, we all got to be each other's family around here, man. That's the only way. Love is the answer. Love is always the answer. You know, I don't want to die alone having wasted. It's not that I'll be alone. If I did, if that happens, that means I have wasted my life. You know, not making any connections that are substantive enough that people will want to send me on my way in a warm blanket. You know? And that's, you know, that's a, that's a healthy fear. That's a healthy fear. Either way. All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here. But, you know, we have some guests that will be coming on maybe this week. Well, I'll, you know, be taping new guests this week and next week. And we'll start plugging them back out there. I'm going to start also maybe going through some of those steps again. I want to thank everybody who's been listening uh, everybody who's been sharing the podcast, it's going really, really well. This is all of our show. Like I said, it's not just mine. It's spiritual experience. You know, this is where we all grow. And this is, uh, this is not the end of the line. All right, guys, peace. We want to thank you all for joining us today. And please don't forget to like and subscribe on all podcast platforms. And find us on Facebook where you can become part of our family. We'll see you around.